Good evening. That's okay. As we go through this series, so we talked about this morning that we're just trying to get you to tell the truth about what you've seen and heard and what God has done in your life and, and how that has impact. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 9, it's a, it's a very familiar passage of scripture to us about the healing of the blind man. And I kind of titled this, The Blind World, The Blurred Church in a New Day. And it kind of describes everything that happened there, the spiritual blindness that the world had about what was happening around them. And then the Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the leaders of the church of that day, how everything was kind of obscured and blurred, and they really didn't understand what was going on. But because Jesus came and interacted with this man who was born blind from birth, there was this incredible new sight in a new day that brought about change. And I want to read, starting with verse 1 through verse 6, and I'm going to be reading now the New Living Translation. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes, and said, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. The first thing that I want to talk about tonight is Jesus gets us. That first verse said, Jesus saw, not his disciples, Jesus saw and went to the blind man. And I don't know how many times that I've, I've heard, I've said it, young people say, nobody gets me. Nobody understands what I'm going through. We hear that a lot. I'm sure we've even felt that at times. If, if they only knew, you know, then maybe they'd understand and be more compassionate. If they only knew. Well, Scripture tells us that Jesus does know. And in Hebrews 4.15 it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, but he is the one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Um, I'm going to have you watch a video coming up, just kind of a commercial, if you will, about what's going to be happening in the Alpha, who I worked for, we partnered with The Send, and this is an outreach for youth. We're expecting about 60,000 youth from the watch parties, about 250,000 youth who are being asked and challenged to go and share the gospel. And uh, this is just kind of a, I just wanted you to know about it so you can be a part of it and participate in it. It's free. And I'm excited that it's happening in Kansas City. Dear generation, how do you feel? Do you feel the angst of unfulfilled potential? That your action can lead to real change? Who's willing to risk for a future that is not yet? or bet their life not on the promise of the world, but on the promise of Jesus. Who believes that prayer has real power and that the Bible is our source of truth? Who's willing to live on mission as a calling, not as an option? Who believes the need is so great that we cannot look away? There's a reason you feel that way. You were made for a vision bigger than you. Dear generation, you were made for more. That um, right now there's a campaign going on that probably you haven't heard of. And we've been, all we've been talking about in this service 
or these services is about telling your story of what you've seen and heard. That's all we're asking. Uh, Alpha, we partnered with a group called Glue, along with Wheaton College and uh, Lewis Palau out of California and so forth, for a campaign called He Gets Us. And and if you get bored with my preaching, just get on your smartphone and go to hegetsus.com, and you can watch the videos and learn something, too, this evening. So for all you kids, if you get bored, just go to hegetsus.com. And what is amazing about that is all we've done is tell stories of individuals who can relate to what people are going through in society. It's on every platform. If you watch the NCAA tournament, You've probably seen some commercials from that. But here's the response. We started out with a 10-city kind of pilot before we blew this up, starting with the NCAA tournament. But what's interesting about this Generation Z that's coming along, they are so tired with our religion. They're tired of coming to church and doing the same thing and going home. And supposedly that's their journey of faith. They want to do something with their faith. They want to see it in action, and they want to feel it. And they are hungry. What's interesting, since three months ago, we've had 44 million responses from young people in the United States. Asking questions about Jesus. But what's interesting is what they're asking for more than anything else in our society today is prayer. That might shock you from a young person, but that's what they want. Life is so up in arms. You don't know what's going to happen next. Everything's completely changing. Nothing's normal. COVID decided that for us. And then our government's decided things for us. And we feel out of control. It's just like the blind man sitting alongside the road. There wasn't anything in his life that he had control over. He didn't know where his next meal came from because it was dependent on somebody being compassionate and giving him money. He was extremely poor because his parents, as we read through that, the passage later on, they they didn't take care of him. They ignored him. At one point, they, they just told the Pharisees, well, why don't you deal with him? He's an adult. He can take care of himself. A blind man sitting alongside the road. But Jesus saw him. And went to him. What what I've learned from this passage so many times is Jesus sees things that we walk right by. And I don't know how many times I've walked by people who have been in need or made me feel uncomfortable because I didn't know how to interact with them. Homeless people. People along the border that I interact with. You know, we have prisons full of children, babies to 18 year olds, children, children in prisons. I'll take you to one sometime. What's our what's our response to all that? Do we walk on by or do we interact? I was really challenged. I spent about. Two years ago, I guess it's been two years ago, I spent about 18 weeks in California down in San Diego. And there are a lot of homeless there. But I saw something that was interesting that was just kind of ingrained within the culture there. That every time you went out to eat, everybody asked for a to-go box. Everybody did. And then when you left the restaurant, which is really interesting, I saw people look around and look down the alleyways and stuff like that till they found a homeless person to go take that food to. Everybody did that. Everybody did that. There were some guys I walked by every day in the, in the hotel. They were kind of candy cornered. I was downtown San Diego. Uh, up on the hill that's pretty mountainous right there and and um, don't ride any of those scooters you can get for a dollar and ride you know and when it's hilly because if you don't know how the brakes work it can be dangerous I can tell you that from experience but um, 
See, the homeless ride him, so I thought I could ride him. Anyway, right across there was a Domino's pizza place. And people would always gather there and ask, you know, if anybody would give them something to eat. So I was bored and I was, you know, kind of sitting around for meetings to happen and stuff like that. And I said, well, it's time to have a party. So I go over there. And there's about 20, 30 of them there. I said, you guys want to have a party? And I said, yeah. I said, let's all come inside. Well, when everybody came inside, that really got everybody's attention at Domino's. And, and I said I was going to feed everybody. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And then they said, well, they can't eat it in here. And I said, what do you mean they can't eat it in here? Well, they're dirty. And I said, that's okay. We'll sit on the sidewalk and I'll call Pizza Hut and give them my money. He goes, no, 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 we'll, we'll give you the pizzas. Just make sure they clean up after themselves. As we sat there, and I started to talk and get to know individuals who were there, it was amazing their God stories that they told. You know, that we're so arrogant when we say, well, somebody should just pick themselves up from the bootstraps and get a job. You know, well, I want to know how you're going to get rent on an apartment when it costs $3,500 a month and you have to have a month's down payment plus the first month's rent. You guys got seven grand on you? How am I going to get a job when I don't have an address? Do you know that 75% of all homeless people are vets? Makes me sick the mental health issues and the physical issues and things they went through. But I just kind of point that out because those are people we just walk on by. Here's a guy who is born blind, who's begging, that everybody was walking by. But Jesus saw him. Jesus sees things in people because he sees a soul, not a project. Individuals with disability. We walk right by them. We don't interact with anybody because we think we don't know how to act. Treat, treat them like a person. The, the most amazing testimony I remember when, when we lived in Ohio, Tammy was a communications director, meaning that she worked with adults with disabilities and they would evaluate them and help them have devices to help them learn how to communicate better. Sometimes it's a computer that was eye sensitive that you could type and different things like that. And there was this gal who was blind. And Tammy was really burdened about sharing Jesus with everybody. And how do you share Jesus with people who can't communicate? So one day she decides, I'm just going to sing. And she happened to sing Amazing Grace. And got to that last line where it said, I was blind, but now I see. And that little girl began to cry and said, when I die and go to heaven, will I see? And Tammy said, yes. And she says, I want to know Jesus then. We walk by people that we need to interact with, to engage just the same way that Jesus engages with us. How, it's important to understand that we know that disciples were followers. So, so I, I, we overlook this part spiritually. Jesus always led. He was always a leader. He always led. And his disciples always followed. So during that time, we would say that people were being led by Jesus. In the same way today, we need to ask the question, am I being led by the Holy Spirit? Because I'm still a follower. And that's important because I don't think we get and in, in, in the areas that I end up in and places that I've been, we don't carry a Bible with us 24-7. And there have been a lot of times I couldn't find an answer in that book. And I've been in situations where I've had to pray quick and hard and had to depend on the Holy Spirit 
to tell me what to do. Listen, as closer as Jesus comes to his return, we better be led by the Spirit or we're going to be deceived. You better be in tune. He's a deceiver. You better get it right. People are manipulators. I'm, inmates are great at that. Holy cow. I've, I've learned a lot. Governments are manipulators. And are you so confident in yourself that you can't be led astray? We talk about leading, being led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14, King James Version says, For as many who are led by the Spirit of God are called sons of God. If I'm a son, and led by the Spirit. But what does that mean? So I, I want to share with you what that means. I call it a nudge. Some people said God spoke to me. Other people said, you know, you see, laid something on my heart. Different. I like to call it a nudge. And so this is my question of what a nudge is. A nudge is a sudden, deep down sense from God that you ought to do something. Unconvenient in that moment. A deep down sense that you ought to do something that's inconvenient in that moment. We've all kind of been there before. I remember the first time I kind of saw that happen. Um, Dad was managing the truck stop out there, running the truck stop, eighth grade. And I was out there, and so my job was to do wh whatever it was, depending on who didn't show up to work. I hated that job. It was from mowing grass to making beds in the motel to doing dishes. I just hated that job. And one day, this homeless guy came up, and he asked if he could have something to eat. And I remember that Dad took that guy, and if you remember, in the bottom of that restaurant, they used to always have a buffet, a restaurant down there. You know, so much better than the grill cooking up above. And God, and, and dad took that guy, took him downstairs and put him in line and he says, eat all you want. Man, did that get a reaction. Man, you talk about pushback from employees and everybody else and, you know, talking bad about dad and calling him this and that and everything. And I'm hearing everything. And I go home and I ask dad why he did that. Why didn't you just feed him upstairs? Why did you take him downstairs in front of the buffet and said, eat all you want? And this is what he said. I might be hungry someday, and I hope that people would treat me the same way. Jesus has been hungry before. Remember his time in the desert? When he tells us to minister to the least of these, Jesus has been naked before. He wouldn't wear no loincloth when they crucified him to the cross, people. We do that for us people. What does it mean to be nudged? A lot of times what we do is this. We're like Gideon. We say this prayer and say, God, I'm going to put this fleece out. And if this happens, then I'll know that I should be obedient and do this. Well, let me tell you something. The reason Gideon put out a fleece was because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. So stop praying that way and stop putting out fleeces. Because God's not going to answer. He's already talking to you. And he wants you to be obedient and engage people. The disciples here ask this incredible question, who sinned? And Jesus said... Because there's a belief back then that you could sin in the womb. And where that came from, from the teaching of the Pharisees, was when Jacob and Esau fought in the womb in that story. So they said that you could sin in the womb before you were born. And so everything was a consequence of sin. If you had a disability, it was because some type of sin in your life or sin from your parents. And Jesus said, no one has sinned here. What's interesting about that question to me is when we don't understand something or a situation, all we do is ask questions. 
And, and we point out, and we, somebody says, well, what about him? What is his situation the way it is? I wonder what was going on in his life. I wonder, why his, I wonder how he was raised. What's wrong with him? And it's interesting, the reason we ask questions is because we have no genuine interest in what the truth is. And the truth here was no one sinned. And that God had come there to share with him and to reveal his glory. Have you ever felt stuck? Here's a blind man alongside the road, and he's stuck. He's stuck in his situation. We've all felt stuck in some circumstances. You ever felt stuck in a job? Yep. You ever felt stuck at school, college, or a certain degree? Or cl- Yeah. You ever feel like your marriage or your relationships aren't going where you feel stuck? Yeah. The blind man was stuck. The only way that he could learn a living was to beg. That's all he had. Parents weren't helping him. There was no government to help him. He's stuck in his situation. Now, I think a lot of us end up doing what the blind man did. Because when we feel stuck, we resolve ourselves and we sit down and we tell ourselves it's just time to endure. (laughs) Isn't that it? I'm enduring this marriage. I'm enduring this job. I'm enduring this situation. When the blind man had to get to the point, until you get to the point that you are so disgusted and hate your circumstance to the point where you say, okay, Lord, whatever it takes. Only until we get to that point will we ever be blessed and healed and see clearly. He meant whatever it takes. Can you imagine hearing that? See, back then, people spit on people. If women got out of line and the husband was frustrated with them, he would spit on them in public to show his disgust and her value. And people would spit on people with disabilities and spit on him. Can you imagine? He's thinking, oh, here it comes again. Jesus asked him if he wants to see. But he's got to the point in his life, okay, Lord, whatever it's going to take, I'll do it. And he mixes mud and saliva. And there's a lot of symbolic meaning in that and everything. But what are you willing to endure So that Jesus can bring clarity in your life. What are you willing to do so Jesus can bring clarity in your life? It's I, the, the next thing that I want to talk about is that our sight clears up when we're obedient. He tells a man to do something, verse 6. He says, go. He asks him to do something. He just doesn't heal him. He tells him to do something. And I'm wondering what God is asking you to do to clear up your vision. Now, we read God's word, and we can get information and knowledge from that. And uda is the Greek word for that. But there's another Greek word for to know. It's gnosko, which means to know from experience. So this is what I'll share with you. When you're obedient to something that the scripture says, there's going to be revelation given to you that is different and deeper than anything that you've ever read in the Bible. Because you're being obedient and you're aligning yourselves in God's will to bring about his kingdom on earth from heaven. And when you're doing that, now think about this. You're doing God's work. You're doing Jesus' work. And when we're obedient, there's clarity through this experience. I'll give you an example. I, I hated shop class in high school. I wasn't very mechanical. I read the book. I flunked all the tests. I wasn't very good. I didn't understand combustion and all that other stuff. 
But then all of a sudden, I got a lot smarter. You know when I got a lot smarter? When he finally led us to go out there and we got to touch the engines and tear them apart. Because I was experiencing what I read, there was a knowledge and understanding that came as a result of that, that finally it was almost like an aha moment. Oh, I get it. Because I was experiencing it. The scripture, there's aha moments all throughout scripture where there's a revelation, if you will, a new revelation that's deeper and spiritual that brings about sight and clarity when we're obedient. That's deeper than just reading the scripture. And it's amazing when that happens. And it's exciting when that happens. I get excited. I'm, I'm not mechanical and I'm not a carpenter. But I, I whoop and holler when I'm able to get something fixed. At least my wife does. And it's exciting. I did it. And, and Jesus wants that victory for you. To clear up our sight because of obedience. It's, it's, if I go to the next one. Don't let what you see get in the way of what you know. Everybody there saw a blind man see again. And everything they saw got in the way of what they knew. Nobody believed it. His parents didn't believe it. The disciples questioned it. The Pharisees didn't believe it. The community didn't believe it. Oh, isn't this the guy that used to be blind? The, the next slide is an interesting thing that I think we do a lot of at times is I think we, I do. I question too much of what I see and even if it's in conflict with what I know the Bible says and I miss out on miracles. Um, two years ago, I'm in West Palm Beach. Uh, might be three years ago. March, right before they closed down the country. I'm in West Palm Beach I'm doing a training with several um, mega churches staff there. We're doing an alpha training and training leadership and stuff like that. We come in, there's, I don't know, 100 and some people there. And we kind of split up in small groups. And so they have this get to know you type of thing. Go around the circle and tell us something about yourself. Well, most of the time it's, it's pretty harmless and it's pretty lame and it really doesn't matter. We tell something goofy about ourselves or, you know, I'm addicted to donuts or just something like that. And we come to Maria. Maria and Juan are the pastor, husband and wife at the fastest growing Hispanic church in West Palm Beach. And she speaks in really bad, broken English. And so what she gets out was, I was dead and Jesus raised me. That's what she said. And it kind of got quiet at our table. I mean, that's, that's kind of heavy. And, and then you think, well, we just must misunderstand her. You know, what is she really trying to say? So we asked one of the interpreters, what is she saying? And she said that she was dead and God raised her from the dead. And that happened three weeks ago. And, of course, like anything else, we're sitting there. Oh, this is what I do. I start getting skeptical. I'm like the Pharisees with the blind man. Ah, I don't know. That's kind of out there. She was dead and raised from the dead. And so we asked her, would you explain? And she said, well, her and her, hus her, and her son... We're riding bicycles with a couple other people from church, and they're riding down the street, and there came a semi alongside them that was carrying cars. And when the semi went to turn, he came over against them. Now, in, in uh, Florida, they have these lanes for bicycles. You know, they're ch -ch -ch -ch, where bicycles are supposed to be, cars are supposed to stay out of. He came clear into that. And so what happened was she went to get over. Her son's was, son was leading and she was behind him. She went to get over and her front uh, wheel got tangled into his back wheel and it threw her underneath the semi 
and the trailer, all three axles ran over her. She laid there on the ground, dead. She wasn't breathing. She wasn't moving. Her eyes were open. Several people ran out there and checked on her for a pulse. There was nothing. People just kind of pulled away and backed up. The people of church said her son was there, was just bawling and crying. And all of a sudden, there was a, a lady who came from the crowd, walked out over to her, reached down, picked up her hand, and she got up, she sat up and walked over to the sidewalk and sat down. And she said, that's my story. But she goes, that really wasn't the miracle. And we're all thinking, wow, how can this get any weirder? So this is what she said. Now, the healing of the blind man said was to bring about God's glory, right? So show God's work displayed. And so she goes on to tell this story. She goes, here's the real miracle through the translator. Four weeks after God raised me from the dead, it was my daughter's wedding. And at the wedding, at the reception, my daughter came up to me and asked if I wouldn't give my testimony. She's telling her story. And she said up there, said, I, I stood up there and I told my story and God nudged me to ask people if they want to make Jesus Lord of their lives. And you know what happened in the middle of a reception? 62 people stood up and walked forward and got on their knees and gave their lives to Christ. She said, that was a miracle. That's why God raised me from the dead. I couldn't argue with that. Don't let what you see get in the way of what you know. Like the Pharisees. If you go to the next slide. Don't overcomplicate things. When the blind man's given his testimony, if you go back to that passage in John 9... So this is his testimony. These are words he actually says. Verse 11, he says, I received my sight. Verse 15, he put mud on my eyes and I was blind, now I see. Verse 25, one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. Verse 30, he opened my eyes. We have overcomplicated witnessing. That's all he shared. You don't have to take a course to share your story. We've been sold that. I mean, the schools made money off of me, told me I needed to take these classes so I could be a better witness and give my testimony and everything else. And I paid it. Don't overcomplicate things. Tell what you have seen and heard. Now we talked about this morning. God wants you to tell the truth, what you have seen and heard in your life. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. For witnessing. For witnessing. The other thing, the fifth thing, and the next one that I put up there that is real simple is you don't need to know much to be a witness. <laughs> this guy didn't know anything other than what happened to him. You're telling me I don't have to have 20 scriptures memorized or the Roman road and all these things, yep, that's what I'm telling you. Do you know three-fourths of the Christian world don't have a Bible? I've handed out Bibles in places, in closed countries and so forth, and watched people just weep. Groups of people weeping, they have one Bible. Are you led by the Spirit? We've used this. I don't know. I left my Bible down there. Do not get me wrong. I, did, I am not saying this. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. We need to be in God's word to lead and guide our lives. We have relied on that way too much, people, because that has become our Holy Spirit. It's words on a page. we got to be led by the Spirit. We have to be. Hundreds and hundreds of years went by without 
having anything written down. Oral tradition. Do you know we're almost back to that in the United States? 20% of the population of the United States is illiterate. 46% of the United States reads less than a sixth grade level reading. And so I have to really worry about what type of translation that I give out to people when I give out a Bible because they can't even read the words or pronounce some of them. And so my testimony means something. We've become oral learners again, just talking. They are visual and oral learners. What do they do? They watch TikTok and YouTube. What do you do if you want to fix something? You look it up on YouTube. Am I right? Oral communication is valuable. Listen, the most valuable organ that you have in your body that God created you with is your mouth. This instrument of vocal cords to share the gospel is the most powerful thing God has given you. To share the gospel. I am so thankful of the people who did not give up on me. While I was running around and doing things I shouldn't. And they kept coming back. And they kept encouraging me. And they kept telling me about their story. You see, I didn't want to become a Christian because I thought Christians were wussies. I didn't want to be a man and be weak. I didn't want anything to do with that. Until I had a conversation with Danny Asher. At that time, was playing baseball in, in um, at, um, I'm trying to think, I <laughs> went blank. Because here's a kid that was strong. His family built homes. He did that all the time on the side. He's very athletic. Everybody wanted to be around him. He was cool. He wasn't weird. I thought being a Christian was weird. He was strong. He was manly. But you know what he told me about that got my attention? He told me about all those weaknesses. And I never would have guessed that. And he says an athlete works on their weaknesses. I said, yeah. He goes, you know, you go in the gym and you work on things, or you go to the weight room and you work on several muscles and stuff like that. He says the same thing spiritually. Until you know what you're weak at, you'll never be strong. And God has showed me spiritually what I'm weak at, and I work on that. Just an easy testimony. He's just telling me a story. It wasn't complicated. He didn't give me evangelism explosion or the Roman road. He just told me what he's seen and heard in his life. And it changed my life. It changed my life. The next thing I want you to see, two more things. Verse 16, if you read that in that chapter 9, verse 16 says, And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Life gets harder when you follow Jesus. It doesn't get easier. I was sown that bill of goods. And we taught that for years and years. Life gets harder when you're a Christian. I'll give you an example. Years ago at Flaming Spirit Camp, I was pastoring over Oak Christian Church. Jim was here. Roger Charlie was up at Northwest Missouri State University and stuff like that. And back at that time... There wasn't a camp board. They didn't own the camp. It was owned by a family. And they had lots of rules. Anyway, during that week, it was high school week, and one of the nights, a girl came forward, and she gave her life to Christ, and she wanted to be baptized. Well, the camp had a rule, 
And the rule was you couldn't be baptized unless you called your parents and got permission. She called home and her parents said no. They weren't Christians. All the other pastors there said, we're not going to baptize them. We're going to honor their parents. I got hacked. You got you know Bruce got hacked. So I said, well, I'll just take her down there and baptize you. You're not baptizing her on this property. So I got a pickup. I went, had some hogs at the time. Took their water tank, dumped it out, put it in the back of my picket, filled it full of water, drove it down to Flaming Spirit Camp, and parked it on the road just outside the gate. I walked the girl out there and baptized her. She was 18. That was my argument. She's an adult. She didn't need to call home. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the rules. When she got home, her dad beat her. Bruised her up pretty good. I remember the next day I get a phone call. And so I decide to go check on her. And I go and, and I knock on the door and her parents are home. She's there. She's got a black eye. And the first thing I said to her was, I'm sorry. She goes, don't be sorry. She goes, I am so excited. She goes, I feel happy. Really, really happy. I'm not alone anymore. When we step out and follow Jesus, it will cost us something. The issue is in America... We haven't stepped out in a mighty, powerful way, so we haven't received any persecution. Take on it. It's coming. It's coming. I have staff that I work with who are in Ukraine. We had an international phone call about three weeks ago. And we were talking to them on the phone and asking them about what's going on there and everything else. And, of course, the question was, are you fleeing? What's happening? Da, da, da. And everybody there, there was even a, a Baptist pastor who was there who had planted several churches in Kiev. And they all said the same thing. No, we're not leaving. We just feel if God's bringing other people to us, they must need to know Jesus too. Can I get a witness? Any of you want to volunteer and go over there? Can I get a witness? It's amazing, the last verse, 34 the Pharisees come to him and they kick him out of the temple. They kick him out of the temple. Jesus finds him later on because he didn't know who healed him. He'd only heard him. He, haven't, he hasn't seen him. And Jesus heard he got kicked out of the temple and he comes back to him and he asked him who he thought he was, the prophet. And he said, well, I'm the Lord. And he bowed down and worshiped him. So I want you to see this. When everybody else leaves you, Jesus will not. He came back for him. Jesus will not. Yea, though I walk in the valley of shadow of death, I will not leave you. I will not leave you. I will be there for you. So I want to challenge you as you go home tonight. Think about sharing your story. I want you to understand that Jesus gets you. And he'll go out of his way 
to find you and to bring blessings to your life so that you can have spiritual clarity to see things you've never seen before. And that he loves you. He loves you deeply. Will you pray? Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this story about the blind man. Father, I'm so thankful. Uh, God, I ask that you forgive my unbelief. Believe. Help me believe. Help us to have boldness to share our stories. God, help us to start at least with our families, our children. Help us to tell our story to our children what Jesus has done in our lives. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.